Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Utah Story Show. My name is Richard Marcosian. Today on the program, a very exciting episode. Uh, we bring to you two of my favorite Salt Lake City mayoral candidates. We're talking to David Ibarra and Luz Escamalia about four of the important issues we've been covering here at Utah Stories Magazine. Um, those issues and they're in order that we talk to, talk to them about them, is number one, the Inland Port. And if you don't know about it, um, it's the decision by the state legislature foisted on the city to take 16,000 acres of wonderful, you know, undeveloped land and turn it into a giant shipping and receiving center. It'll, it will actually become a port of entry for international trade. Um, the problem with that is we live in a bowl-shaped valley. We have terrible pollution at certain times of day. We don't need thousands of additional semi-trucks uh, coming in and out of an inland port. Um, people are enraged about it. There was a riot in early Ju uh, July. It's a very hot-button issue, and these two candidates have a lot to say about it. Uh, number two, we talk about affordable housing. We have a housing crisis, they're calling it. I, I don't know why I'd call it a crisis, but there's a lack of affordable housing in Salt Lake City right now. And it's because um, basic laws is supply and demand. There is not enough supply to meet the demand. There's a lot of people who want to move to Salt Lake City uh, because we have wonderful environment, wonderful mountains, um, wonderful quality of life. And we need, we need to have affordable housing for people who want to live here and people who want to get their family started. And I have to wait till they're, you know, 45 years old to buy a house. Number three, we talk about medical cannabis and Proposition 2 in Utah. Another huge important topic because what's happened is the Utah State Legislature, given direction by the LDS Church, rewrote Proposition 2. The LDS Church decided to come in, take what we had passed as residents of Utah, and by and large part it was members of the LDS Church who passed Proposition 2, and come in and just say, no, nah, we're going to control this just like we control liquor. Everybody's going to be under our control and authority. I call it a fascistic monopoly on the trade of medical cannabis, just like they have with the trade of liquor. It's not right. We're talking about how the city can fight back against the state in that um, regard. We also talk a lot about how, you know, there's, a, there's an identity crisis, right? Um, Salt Lake City's very, very diverse. Um, it's very now liberal. We're going to probably elect our, I think, eighth liberal to mayor, the mayor's office in a row. Uh, and it's, it's definitely got a different character than the rest of Utah, which is predominantly Mormon. So how do we handle this sort of identity crisis that we're dealing with? And then finally, we talk about homeless issues in Utah. I've talked about these a lot. I've done a documentary film about the homeless problem when we were doing Operation Rio Grande. Um, if you want to check that out, you can um, see it at the end of my, my show. So anyway, these are the four core issues. I think these are the most important issues we are faced with as Salt Lake City residents. Uh, we want to see how Luz Escamalia, who's been in the state Senate for a long time, wonderful uh, leader, advocate for especially minority and um, uh, lower strata, you know, lower socio socioeconomic people, um, poor people. Uh, she's been an advocate for poor people for a long time. Um, and David Ibarra, who has been a CEO of many different companies, he's been a corporate coach, very successful man, very two very different people we're presenting here, how they want to talk and, exp and, and uh, address these four very important issues. So without further ado, my discussion with Salt Lake City mayoral candidates, David Ibarra and Luz Escamilla. All right, Luz Escamilla and David Ibarra, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I guess my first question is, why do each of you want to be mayor? Or you? Yeah, why do you want okay. to be mayor? Go Perfect. First, well, I want to be mayor because I, I, over my career, I have developed some skills where I have uh, coached uh, hundreds of companies all across America and CEOs. I was raised in Utah, born in Utah, raised in Utah foster care, 
I uh, grew up in business, starting as a dishwasher, worked my way up to the point I am today, and I just feel like in the fourth quarter of my work career, it's a good time to offer my skills to public service and to add on to the other things that I've done uh, for our community and in uh, boards and uh, assignments that I've had from governors, mayors, and uh, President Clinton in the Air Force Academy. Yeah, that's a cool background. So you you kind of started out by realizing that hard work could get you ahead, I, I assume, and is that what made you want to start your first well, business? I, I, I Well, first of all, it was fear. Uh, how was I going to make a uh, living? I started as a dishwasher and then a busboy and a uh, server, and, 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 and I found out that there's two things that you really need to be successful, capital or talent. I didn't have any capital, so I had to zero in on talent, and I had to get a reputation of being an individual that could fix things. So with Marriott, they sent me all around the country uh, to fix some things that were going wrong in different restaurants or properties that they had, and I gained a reputation and grew up through the company, and in 10 years, I became the director of training for the Western United States and became the turnaround artist for uh, our restaurant division. Very cool. All right, how about you, Luz? Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. It's always nice to be back at Utah Stories, and I've been very lucky to be highlighted in one of your articles before, so thanks for this opportunity. Yeah, you were in our women issue. Um, Just uh, why I'm running for Salt Lake City Mayor, I think it's the timing right now where Salt Lake City is, it's at a crossroads, where we really need a leader with a vision of sustainability as we move forward. We're growing really fast. Our economy is strong and growing, but then you're starting to see the disparities in wage gaps, in opportunities for people to afford to live in Salt Lake City. And I'm, I want to be the mayor that will bring all of the people together. I'm all about inclusiveness and making sure that people have the opportunity to enjoy the quality of life that makes us stay here in Salt Lake City and live here. Uh, we also need to uh, make sure we really become the destination for education, for businesses, for inclusiveness. And there's still things we can do to get us there. And one of the things we need to do is collaboration. And I feel I'm the right person to collaborate. I have 11 years in the state legislature where I've done that successfully as a member of the minority party, passing more than 50 bills and addressing Yeah. And I, I really appreciate how you've been so outspoken about clean air and how that is an issue that really affects the poor and minorities more than the rich and wealthy because the people who are affected most by it live in the bottom parts of the city where the pollution is the worst. And and so related to, you know, creating a, a, a better Salt Lake and you mentioned maintaining our standard of living What do you think about this inland port? And we'll probably focus on this issue because it just seems like it's such a hot button issue right now. Do you feel like that this lawsuit was the right move by the mayor? What what went wrong and how do we get where we are here and how could you fix that? So thank you for that question as a a resident of Rose Park, (laughs) where in part of that, my Senate district happens to be where the inland port is and I, had to address the concerns of constituents in tears calling me about how this is literally going to, they, they have no place to go. This is home for them. And the idea that they will have this congestion, this massive number of semis now coming their way, uh, potentially, you know, some of them with fear of coal and other really uh, polluting, um, you know, items coming that way. So one, I think the conversation has been taking place for a while. This is not new. I think there's been a lack of leadership in terms of how do they align those conversations with the state. And the state got tired of waiting. Um, Always the fighting between the council and the mayor didn't help. Um, Not having this united front on this important issue, which even though they did have their master plan for the Northwest Quadrant, it took a lot of years to get to that master plan. The state, you know, was interested in seeing this as a potential place for a port of entry which is really what an inland port is. And 
the very few conversations that happen about what it means to be a port of entry. And, you know, my my husband, as a former mayor of a city that was a port of entry, is like, you guys wait because this is a massive thing. I mean, you will have containers that will become, you know, we will become the place for U.S. Customs to actually be 16, the ones. 16,000 acres. Yeah. It's a huge, yeah, it's a huge, huge place. And we will be that port of entry for mm-hmm. containers from all over the world, right, that instead of sitting in Long Beach. But here's the thing. So one is the process. I think people are very frustrated about the lack of transparency and process, the lack of leadership from the city, um, and then negotiating at the end. That's why you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so lawsuit, I think it was at the end what the mayor had at her um, ability to do at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there is not much we can do about what happened in the past. Moving forward, I think the lawsuit is critical for a couple of things. One, it shows that Salt Lake City still wants to stand strong on what they think is the right uh, vision for the city, <clears throat> protecting the residents, which is the number one priority that we should be focusing. And this will create a huge environmental impact if we don't do it right. I mean, yeah, that's uh, yeah. there's no way you can get I away mean, with that. How can you say it won't Correct impact our that. standard of living? It will yeah. impact that. So I think the lawsuit is what um, the current mayor had at her disposal, especially with the uh, fighting that she had with the council, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that dissonance. And then, um, so moving forward, it will create maybe some patterns and some guidelines that the courts can come down and have set some precedent yeah. that to protect even future municipalities. I have to tell you, the Constitution is very clear that allows the state um, to do that type of um, ability to say, we're going to go over, take the tax increment, that uh, land use authority, which is the biggest concern. That is private property, by the way. Most of that land is privately owned. Hmm. So development was, is going to happen no matter what. Mm-hmm. I think that is the only opportunity we have is to make it right. So you need a mayor with a vision that can bring all of the players together. And as things are moving forward, whether it's through a lawsuit mm-hmm. or potentially having changes happen mm-hmm. on the Inland Port Authority governing board or re, you know, getting back our tax increment, whatever the case is, you need someone that could sit at, have everyone at the table, stakeholders, Talk about how we go as emissions free as possible. How do we make it a place that is net zero, renewable energy coming in? I mean, we need to be against sustainability moving forward, and that's how I see this critical issue being addressed. Yeah. David, do you think the city can win this lawsuit against the Well, First of all, I'd say that the uh, uh, Utah Constitution is not clear. And if it was clear, we wouldn't be having a lawsuit. Well, didn't they change the Constitution uh, well, through a House bill to the, be able to allow the authority to Well, the, 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 to the issue to is the supersede. Ripper Clause. But in, in any time that we're not attorneys, when mm-hmm. two uh, attorneys go to battle, each of them believe that they could win. So it's not clear. We'll find out, and I believe that the lawsuit must go forward. Now, this is, to me, a, a perfect example of uh, leadership misbehavior. And probably on both sides. Now, how it happened, I don't know. But this has always been a city initiative. So this lawsuit is not about stopping the inland port. This lawsuit is about who has jurisdiction Mm -hmm. over the port. So the mayor, the council, and they they were interested in the port. My view is that this port should not be built unless it's net zero environment. And most people will look at it and say, how can it happen? If you have the political will and you look outside of even our borders in the United States to Europe, there are ways to get very close. I doubt that you can get all the way. But in wetlands, we mitigate. And if we took a look at where 90 percent of the tax increment has been taken from our city, we've been given a bone, if you will, of 10 percent for affordable housing for 40 years. Never heard of a deal like that in my entire career. What we should be looking towards is how do we, uh, one, we don't build it unless it's environmentally net zero. But we should look at, could it be? The idea that a group of individuals that don't have the specialized skills that can say whether a lawsuit can be won or whether it can be built environmentally or not, let's get some experts at the table and determine it. Now, if it can't, we should not go forward. Well, how could you possibly have semi-trucks by the thousands coming in, well, in and out, and have it be yes. net zero. Well, in the first place is that semi trucks are going to be coming right. anyway. Everybody, all of us are ordering from where? Amazon. Yeah. That uh, th- th- that comes from somewhere. But there is, and I'm in the automobile business, 
and I get asked to speak about what our future is from China to Detroit. The electric engine for di- for diesel long haul trucks is here, and whether or not that could be moved into the uh, a port. Whether three years from now it, it, it is an engine that uh, a diesel that switches over to natural gas, whether five, it's, it's 100% electric right now. The trucks that are going to the Los Angeles ports are the, are, are the lowest emissions. The ones that, that can't go there would come to ours. But we're talking about something that they haven't even gotten to the point of talking about the environmental, how they're going to build it. And everybody's got an opinion about how it's going to be. They haven't even got to that point yet. But my, my belief is the lawsuit must go forward. You have to get the tax increment uh, uh, redone. It should be at least 30, 70, 20. And then if we can't get to net zero, well, then let's talk about the state uh, investing in 10, 20,000 affordable homes in Salt Lake City that would mitigate what the pollutions that are being put in the air because we have 190,000 people that leave this city and come back every uh, day, and 40% of them, 80,000, want to live here. Yeah. If we looked at that, affordable housing is the key issue to so many problems within our city. And what we need to do is to get folks that get how to put motion, actions into motion, followed by another and then another and another, and get something done instead of just getting around a group and talk about it. Yeah. Well, I'll get back to you on affordable housing. But Liz, regarding affordable housing, I mean, that has been sort of a platitude that the state and the city they talk about it but it just doesn't happen it's and it's because developers just look at the amount of profit they're going to earn on a regular development and they compare that to what they're going to earn on an affordable housing development and obviously it's it's less and they want to make you know as, as much or more how do you address that issue how do you force developers hands to actually produce that kind of housing so one i think um just going back in terms you ask how do you get to net zero or emissions free, you have to electrify it as much as you can and use rail. We can use rail there. The congestion will be real and it's already congested. If you live there, you know what I'm talking about. If you have to travel that area, we're also having a lot of um, pollution based on the airport. No one's talking about that and that is growing. So there's a lot of pieces that need to happen. And you know, in that place that will have an impact on the whole state. This is not only about Salt Lake City. My vision is that we need to start talking about our capital city and having everyone have a vested interest on a great capital city. Affordable housing is one of them. You can't talk about Salt Lake City without addressing cost. And the cost of living, including housing, is is ridiculous now. I mean, for working class families, right, and working individuals, working class individuals. So one is they are... Um, at a minimum, we should be talking 10 to 15% of those units that developers are working on in Salt Lake City. They need to be affordable. They need to be integrated on all the units. You can't just say, oh, third floor is the one that's going to be for affordable housing. And affordable housing, needs to. we need to broaden that definition that includes the reality of working families in Utah. And that is, it's not only for, you know, very, very low-income people. It's about everyone that's in a transition. So we also have to start addressing transitional housing in some of these conversations. So you're talking about maybe the single parent that is barely working, but, hey, if they don't have child care, there's no way they can work. I mean, you have these cycles. So to me is we have to find a holistic approach to integrating conversations beyond the individual silos of an issue. And you work with developers because if you're interested to developing in Salt Lake City, you have to fit with our vision and our ideals and the things that we stand for. And having an integrated community, meaning you're not going to start pushing gentrification, start pushing people out so only the wealthy and the people that have access to resources can actually live in Salt Lake City. That's not what we want. What we value in Salt Lake City is a diversity from a socioeconomic stance all the way to, you know, racial minorities, refugees, immigrants, right? I live in the most diverse part of the state, which is the west side of Salt Lake City and West Valley, which is part of also of what I represent in the Senate. But we we need to embrace those and bring high quality also developers development in those areas. So this affordable housing is to happen across the city. And it may be looking a little bit different depending on the 
the uniqueness of each community because each community in, in Salt Lake City is different. And I think that's part of the beauty of Salt Lake City and we should embrace that. So we don't force necessarily a hundred, you know, 600 unit buildings everywhere in Salt Lake City it may look a little bit different. We may need townhomes in certain areas. So also families can be part of that affordable housing. If it's only apartments, that's not necessarily a conduit for families. But, but there's kind of two schools of thought when it comes to affordable housing. One is you force developers to, to do a certain percentage affordable housing where they just can't develop. The second school of thought is you loosen zoning laws. I mean, if we just opened up zoning today, developers would love to produce more dense, higher story housing. But so what what I think it's the balance of both. You can't have it. I don't think any of them will solve the problem. I think mm -hmm. it's, you have to bring a little bit of everything. And you work in the city, you know, the city in fairness has been working on losing some of those ordinances pieces. They are doing more innovative thinking outside the box where even individuals that own a home can have now the mother-in-law yeah, you know what accessory we okay, dwelling accessory units, dwelling and, yeah, units. and i mean things are happening they're not perfect you need also a lot of enforcement when you go that route and that's expensive right there needs to be uh we need to then putting resources on enforcement so then there's not abuse within the system but i think what's critical in this is um, there are developers that want to do this. I've met a couple that are doing net zero now in all their affordable housing development. They're putting solar panels on those affordable housing because they're doing it in collaboration with the state. They're doing it in collaboration with Rocky Mountain Power, which is, you know, we need that collaboration. So people are being very creative. And I think most people, if you live in Salt Lake City and you want to even develop in Salt Lake City and do business in Salt Lake City, you recognize that there's... Uh, and they that that's what the community wants. <clears throat> they value that diversity, and I think if there's enough developers that I think it's doable, and it actually it makes sense for them financially. I I will argue that uh, I will have an issue if they say no, it doesn't make sense if we bring even 20% of affordable housing units to them because many of those members of those communities will integrate after they get you know their situation is more stable to transitionally moving them into. Yeah, I I mean I think that where where I I'm, I'm a little skeptical is is it's a nice idea, but in reality I I just haven't seen that happening. So what why why is it do you think David well, not get it, not being done right? Like you know we have talked and talked and talked about this issue. We look at uh, you know Mayor <laughs> Becker he had five thousand uh, homes in five years. We look at our current plan is 7,500 in five years. And we took a, uh, a gap of a year and a half to redo the plan that was written by just about the same people uh, in, in our city government. But, uh, you know, we can all sit and point and look and all these things we got to collaborate and do. But the fact of the matter is we've got to move towards uh, form-based zoning. And form-based zoning is that uh, in, in, in our high-density area, that is our downtown area. Every, and when you're in the downtown area to go up and high, have high density and to have activity on the bottom floors, that's, that is our metro lifestyle. And we can do that by uh, form-based zoning and taking, for instance, millennials, which is one out of four, 25% of our population, that want to live in a 400 square foot 500 for seven to 800. I worked with a company out of uh, Los Angeles, WLA. They came in and we did the performa for what it would cost. Would they make money at $800? And they did. It penciled out with no parking. The individuals that would work there, the millennials would have not want a car and they save the 700. You go into a, 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 a six to eight hundred dollar uh, affordable <laughs> Manhattan style 400 square foot uh, uh, a living area, and now you're you're living in where you want to live. You're recreating where you want to uh, have fun, and you're working. Those are the kinds of things. And then in our outside areas, we look at the tech world that are coming in, our young tech world, coming in to disturb the affordable housing industry, just like Uber did to Yellow Cab. We look at Atlanta, where you have plot splitting, uh, and that is a company. Look it up in fabulous yeah, a group of young individuals plot planning where they come in and somebody has lived in a home for their entire lives and their kids are gone 
and they go in and help them convert their bedrooms to suites, common area uh, uh, uses and, and kitchens and, 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 and uh, bathrooms, and then a, uh, a tiny home or a container home in the back. And now you've got five units. And if we are thinking ahead to our new model, autonomous electric cars, which are going to be done in Houston uh, this year. The plan is already out. That's the industry I belong. Some say it'll never happen. It's going to happen in the next 24 months. You could take grids of moving people from grid to grid to grid in an autonomous car, much like an Uber, and we solve so much. We have to go where it's already been done and not just stir the soup and try to convince people we're at a barbecue. Yeah, because I, I mean, housing always follows the laws of supply and demand. And I think the reason why there's so much high end housing being built in downtown Salt Lake, the Fourth West Apartments are building another giant, super mm-hmm. amazing, you know, $1,500 minimum for a studio apartment in downtown. The reason that's happening is because tech is definitely moving into Utah, and that's where the demand is. And and then I, I, I kind of hesitate to think that anything short of massive zoning change would be the real answer, because you look at Denver, they faced this you know, 10, 15 years ago. There's nothing affordable within 10 miles of the city, the city center, and... And I think, but they're not willing to lo- well, loosen I, the zoning laws because you have NIMBYs, you know, they don't want it in their backyard, a loose mm-hmm. zoning law. They don't want mm-hmm. the container in somebody's backyard. So how do you get around NIMBYism when you talk about well, changing zoning? As we look at uh, uh, SROs and uh, ADPs, and we're, we're going to have to have some changes. But the biggest thing that blocks all that is what? I don't want five, six cars in front of the house. And so one thing leads to another, and we got to do them together. But we're going to grow. We have folks that want to be here, but and we have folks that want to invest. If they have a return on their investment, they'll invest. And that's form-based zoning. We've got to change some zoning, not have it built around a car, built around a person. Mm -hmm. It's been done. Other cities have done it, and we can look and do it as well. Mm -hmm. But I tell you what, I think it's an exciting time for everybody because I learned in business, where there is a need and you feel the need, it's good for everybody. It's good for our city. It's good for government. It's good for the private sector. Somebody's going to make a return on their investment. And should that be against the law? Profit is not bad if it's filling our need weak, and then the end user can get what they need. But the one thing, 18 months to get a permit to build an affordable housing unit, 18 months. Two uh, builders told me 18 months. We've got to be able to do it in 90 days if the, they've done their job in submitting 90 days. Because look how long the person in need is having to wait. Yeah. The cycle time is not good, and, it's, and, and people don't want to do business in Salt Lake City. And we've got to stop saying, we're the capital city. You should want to come here because we're the capital city. You should want to come here because we're the friendly city. Yeah. And we want to uh, cooperate and get our residents what they need. And we've got to come off our high oars. Yeah, and to, to go to go back to what, you know, friendly, being known as the friendly city, we had, um, I feel like we have this cultural divide really shaping up <laughs> between the city and the state. Oh, yeah. And I think we have, the culture of Salt Lake City is rapidly changing. Our demographics are changing very fast. and. I see with a lot of issues coming down the pipe, Proposition sure. 2, legalized cannabis, the state decides they want to rewrite a compromise bill that nobody likes. Nobody. Nobody. And they, they, then the state comes down, they say they want, the, they want the inland port, and now we're at odds with the state again. What will you do, lose to kind of make better inroads with the state government that has created that's opposite of the tension that exists right now between Biskupski and, you know, the state representatives and the governor's office. So one, I, I do want to, I'm trying to think so hard on the name of the development and there was one in Rose Park that is net zero and is almost half of it affordable housing and it's wonderful. So I'll get back to you. 
I'll text it to you because I, and I want to tell you the company that's doing it. I think it's possible. It's doable. And we also have to address the fact that there's families that need to be living in Utah. This is not only about young, you know, single people. There's families and, and those kids need green spaces. And we are, that's part of their beauties, our landscape and the green spaces are important. And Salt Lake City shouldn't just be building up. I mean, there's ways of doing this. That needs to be part of the mix. So to answer your question about the state, the state is critical. And the way you start changing those conversations is by who's sitting at the table and, and the relationships you have. And that's my biggest strength, I think, is that opportunity where I've worked with them. I have effectively has done things. Because one thing is for you to say, oh, I know them, have their cell phone. Everybody has their cell phone. It's public info. It's how will that answer, that phone call be answered and have you actually got results done from having relationships? And But there needs to be a buy-in. I think it's the timing is perfect. There is, it's very important to be the capital city. It's critical. It's why Salt Lake City is so important, really. Um, and the state has a vested interest in Salt Lake City. They have to have. Because this is well, where the it, international airport. It almost airport seems like they're trying to grab on to the, the culture, the politics, as much as they can that's going on in the city. And the city has to fight back pretty well, strongly or, to, in order may, to maintain the city. Or maybe they just haven't had a chance to work together. Really? I mean, think that's, I, that I could mean, potentially, you know, and the hard part is there's always a lot of interests, right? Different mm -hmm. interests, different perspectives. I recognize that my colleagues right now in the legislature that come from rural Utah have a totally different perspective of air quality. They do. Yeah. But you and, know what? And they but, don't have to But let me tell it. you, some of them have tons of property here in Salt Lake. <clears throat> they do. And when you start talking from that perspective, but... You know, if it's fighting, if it's calling names, we're not going to get anywhere. This is very high school, right? It's like beyond, really? We're not going to get anywhere. No one gets calling names to people, anything done. So that needs to change. I think everyone sees the writing on the wall. The state is seeing it with the inland port and the fact that they can't even have a meeting completed, like actually hold the whole entire meeting because there's so much dissonance because the public is upset because the constituents are angry. It's beyond now the mayor and, and the you know the governor having a problem is about working collaboration having the opportunity to speak the language that resonates to them and have them the buy-in to see how is it that Salt Lake City needs to stand strong with the state but that we also have different values and that's okay different values doesn't mean that you cannot work together you find common grounds you may have to agree to disagree on issues but we need to have someone that knows how to champion the, the values <clears throat> and ideas of Salt Lake City working in collaboration with the state because we won't be able to proceed and be successful if we don't do that. And, and I mean, really how I see the problem sort of disseminates is like there's the church, there's Marty Stevens, there's then the state legislature, which is, you know, Greg Curtis and the state Senate. And, and it's like <coughs> very hierarchical. The, uh, the hierarchy is very clear the orders come from on high and it's Rocky Anderson was here trying to explain the big problem. Everybody's taking marching orders from the church. So how do you come in and not get mansplained to death on how it's going to be? And how do you, how do you make it clear that we have our own culture? We have our own voice in Salt Lake. Well, for one, as a woman of color and as an immigrant, that's what I've been doing my entire life. So I don't see any difference. I've been successful in actually accomplishing things in the state legislature, very different from anyone that's on the, that's running for our office right now in this mayoral race. So I have a record that speaks for itself. You just have to be respectful. You just have to stand strong. I believe that if I go through policy and evidence base, which is how I, I have a master's in public administration, I have a policy background. That's what I've done the last 15 years of my life. And people are not dumb. I mean, <laughs> There's stuff that numbers speaks for themselves. So you mentioned two issues. You mentioned um, uh, medical cannabis, which was repeal and replace, and of course I oppose that. And I actually run the legislation that cleaned part of the mess they left from the re repeal and replace legislation. And it was a massive bill, but I was able to carry that bill with a Republican legislator from Utah County because I realized that's how things are done. But I clean and I was able to fix it. You have to fix things. You think it's fixed though? You think it's 100% no but it gave me an opportunity to at least be able to protect the people that were that were going to be utilizing it for right now we gave them that protection right away 
And the model that's going to be implemented, which I think is going to be very expensive and probably not as effective, is going to have to change. A lot of this is incremental steps. Is what we call modeling through in public policy. Mm -hmm. And it's part of living, being the blue dot in a red sea. I mean, that is being very realistic. And I think it's not general for people to lie that they're going to be the ones making all these changes when you have to learn how to work with these individuals. And again, it's buying, they have to buy in into the vision that you have. Yeah. A lot of it is through evidence based, data driven. It's how it is, but you can't force things and we're gonna have to work with them. That's how yeah. I see this. And I'm looking forward and excited to do that and and valuing and being the champion that I've been for Salt Lake City, doing it again now as a mayor. Yeah, what do you think about that, David? How, how do you work well, with the state legislature? I can tell you this as a uh, individual who's negotiated hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of deals and when many said it couldn't be done you start by not insulting the other side and you start by finding what do you agree on if we look at our downtown the temple square means something to the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints our business district means something to the state legislature to me our entertainment district means something to the folks that live in Salt Lake. We all have something that we want to protect and grow. And how is it that we live together? It's by respecting each person's interests because it doesn't go against our own. It really does not. Now, I am uh, 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 an individual that came to Salt Lake City. I lived outside of Salt Lake City. I didn't quite fit. I needed to be inside of Salt Lake City because Salt Lake City felt like the rest <coughs> of the nation to me. But I'll tell you is that as, a, uh, as I go in and I speak to the uh, 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 speaker and uh, the president of the Senate and uh, last week the governor and the uh, uh, lieutenant governor, we have a good conversation about our city. And when you walk in prepared and you have something to add, in the conversations of negotiation. It's interesting that when I left those meetings, one individual says to me, gee whiz, David, I forgot I was speaking to a Democrat. <laughs> problem solving is problem solving. Mm -hmm. And you got to bring something to the table and that isn't just, just to be able to point out the problem. That's what we've had in the past. And for me, I'm a problem solver that wants to look at cause don't get offended, start to identify the actions that will eliminate the cause, and get busy removing the ones you can. The things I can't control, I don't spend a moment on. The things I can, I, I'll get after one by one by one. And then when you're done, guess what? The ones that you thought you couldn't control aren't that big anymore. Well, a big problem, I think, is is the, I mean, I've, I've been talking to business owners and even people who wanted to be potential growers and Rocky Anderson who's suing sure. the state over what they're doing Absolutely. with medical cannabis. What do you think is the proper recourse now to take after we as voters pass Proposition 2, which is great, and then we end up with this it, compromise bill, which it, is definitely not it great. It is here. offensive. Yeah. Offensive I agree to think you. that the legislature can come after the people have passed an initiative, two ways of making law, one through the people's will, voting, and the other through legislature. And to come in and, and override that is absolutely offensive, arrogant and offensive. Now, what would be an interesting conversation is to get the individuals that passed the fix bill and have a debate with Rocky Anderson because it wasn't a fix. Yeah. It's a mess. And so those people, I mean, it was arrogant and offensive. Those are the leadership you have to work with, though. Well, I mean, you have to call a spade a spade, and that's what right. it is. So exactly. how do you do it? Well, I tell you what, is that, is that uh, having the lawsuit go through with Rocky Anderson is going to be interesting. But I'll tell you this, is that, is that we would have been better off to not have touched it and let it be solved in the court because we made it worse. Really? We made it worse. But the people, people, we'll hear that people, people that vote, and we had a, uh, a majority in two, in two uh, uh, occasions, we have to follow the will of the people. 
And if we stop listening to people, well, then what are yeah, we, what I mean, are we saying? Proposition two, proposition three. I, exactly. They just ignore what people want because they know we should trust that they know best. And that's sort of the culture we live in. We should trust that those up on high know best. But here in the city, we want to play but by the, our own rules. The end of the day, quite when you have your conversations, and there's going to be things you're going to disagree on. Heck, there's been business deals that I've done that I thought we would never come to uh, uh, compromise. But I didn't get offended when somebody had a different opinion of me. And I didn't get offended when they got a little aggressive with me. It's mm -hmm. only a discussion. We'll go on to the next thing and the next thing. And guess what? When we agree on two or three things, we can come back to something that we disagree on. And at the end of the day, when we look at this issue of uh, medical ma marijuana and we see the kinds of of, of things that I saw just yesterday of the new person that joined the suit and shares the story of his wife uh, and how she had to pass away and he had to be on the hunt for medication for her, we, we are a better people than that. But I think when we disconnect it from recreational uh, marijuana use, then we can get back to this is about comforting somebody that is ill. Mm -hmm. and. And at the end of the day, we're going to come to the right decision, and the folks at the legislature will as well. They'll understand it better, and we'll keep talking, and we'll keep talking. And when we do, we're going to come out with something that will be just fine. But well, we're yeah. not there now. No, we're, I we're think not we're there far now. from it. So, what, what so, do you think so if the conversation better? is about medical cannabis, and yeah. that's a, a great conversation. So, one, um, for six years, we've had this conversation in the legislature. I actually happened to chair the committee where um, Senator Mark Madsen, a libertarian he from- He moved to Puerto Rico, right? He uh, actually, is Peru. Oh, Peru. Yeah, I still oh. keep in contact with him. He's a good friend. Um, he actually left his caucus out of this situation because you know he went through the whole process. We had six years of the most intense conversations about medical um, cannabis and everything related to that. So. Um, you know, when, and I chaired that committee when he presented his bill, he, he came out of the Senate. The House was, everything was gonna be, was being stopped. And that was kind of a very similar to the Prop 2, um, you know, proposition was very similar to his bill in some of the pieces. Because the devil's in the detail when you talk about policy. And I, I wanna make sure we emphasize and, and not undermine the fact that this is a real policy and it's very difficult to implement something like this. Other states have done it by letting the private sector run it, which is where the state's idea that the same they're doing with liquor laws, they're doing it now with cannabis, that's a failure process. Now, when they saw that the public got together and they brought Proposition 2, Prop 3, Medicaid expansion, I'm an expert in Medicaid because I've been a healthcare policy analyst for years. I used to work for Utah Issues. This isn't the backbone of what I've done and the passion I feel. You betcha, as a legislator, I needed to fix as much as I can and I, have lost a lot of respect for Rocky Anderson because all he does is attacks from a racist perspective and mass, you know, and I take offense on the things he said about me personally. But you know, he he likes to do that. It is part of his personality, and I don't know him do personally. Do you disagree though. with his lawsuit? No, not with the lawsuit. What is his personal attacks on me? Yes, I, I haven't heard him. Um, but that's beyond the point. So on the bill, because he called me and we during the session, we were just first trying to bring a couple of things to the attention because, you know, David brought the issue about me debating because that was my bill. So me debating, Rocky, I can do it anytime if he wants to. But the problem was, is how do we first protect? So remember, when Prop 2 was repealed and replaced and I voted against and spoke against it and we can get all on that, it's horrible, it is terrible that they're doing that. We need to change first bills that don't allow that to happen. We need legislation, and we've actually, Democrats have been putting forward legislation. We may take a constitutional amendment to change the fact that the legislature doesn't touch propositions. California has done it, and then it's also a big mess, right? Because you can have a really bad proposition, right? It just happened that Prop 3 and Prop 2, we may all agree here in this room, but if we had another proposition that we may not like, we can now be on the other side having to stop the proposition, right? Yeah. We need to think, I mean, bigger well, yeah, than this. We need representative government. Oh, of course. So thank you. So how do we how do we find the balance where you don't take away the power of the people, which is what happened right now? There are balances. What I suggest is first, bring legislation that at least stays with the intent of the proposition, so that way you protect what didn't happen with Prop 2 and Prop 3, <clears throat> So which was full repeals and replace. So in Prop 2, 
what we needed first is the protection of people. So right now, for three years into the implementation of the full-blown process where you get your card and you go and get, you know, the whole process to put that infrastructure in place, there was no protection for people. I am so proud that we brought that back because people were now being prosecuted because that was not in the law because when they replay and replace, they took that away. So, yes, there's great things on that bill. It didn't make it worse. Now, if for the purpose of an attorney in his legal course, and I don't know what his entire lawsuit says, he may have said, oh, the fact that you brought it back and that protection is now in place may hurt me in my in my lawsuit. I first have to protect the people that are utilizing it right now to make sure that the, and that's the affirmative defense. I brought it back. So, yes, I stand behind that. And that's what if he, that's what he's criticizing. Well, I'm sorry, I have to protect the people right well, now in that situation. And now it feels like the same game we've played for the last 50 years concerning liquor laws. Like the church will will decide they will give a little bit if they can take a little bit. And are we going to be playing that game, David, for the next 10 years concerning medical cannabis where they they have all these patient restrictions that other states don't have, well, they're now saying no autoimmune deficiencies I, are going to yeah. be... I, You know, I, I think there's a, a good hope on the horizon as other states uh, enact and we can see results of uh, how this has helped the comforting of somebody in need. Uh, we're a compassionate group of people, and I think that uh, it'll, it'll leave the alcohol... Uh, 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 connection and and we'll do the right thing. You know, when we take a look at uh, our our, uh, our our addiction to opioids and 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 the reports that you know we're we're a nation that uses eighty percent of all opi- opioids and what were three hundred and fifty million yeah, people it's, that it's terrible. that it is this is a good transition to uh, uh, help somebody relieve. Uh, in, in, in a, a relief in 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 pain and and common sense, I think, in the end will prevail. And uh, you know, I can get a little excited, but I'll I'll tell you this: is that uh, when it comes to this, I I uh, I believe the conversation uh, continues. I, I agree with Luce in this: is that uh, uh, it we need to have the kinds of conversations where we need to do what we're doing. We need to have. I, I hate calling it a fight. But it is definitely a, a robust a conversation. And at the end of the day, I just absolutely have faith in the people of Utah that we're going to come back to comforting people in need. And if this is the, what they need because of seizures or other things, I have a partner, an ex-partner that is having problems with seizures that could get some relief and can't because he lives in Utah. Now, I believe those stories are going to start to resonate, and uh, and I think that our legislators are 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 going to want to do the right thing because everybody has somebody that's having a problem uh, with either being prescribed uh, uh, pain medication to the point that they uh, have an addiction, or it, we've got to have a different way. And 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 this is a is this is new. But it's but we're not the first state, so we'll we, we've got other examples, and there'll be other data come forward. And when it's unshakable data, I I, I, I have faith. In well, Utah. it's it's interesting that the greatest advocates for like the Truce Group were actually LDS patients yes. for med, for medical cannabis Truth, and and well, I and think the, as the as the more and more studies happen as more yeah. patients come forward as the truth comes out hopefully the church can yeah. realize this is not alcohol we shouldn't treat it like well the and, and you have the federal government i mean we have a bigger problem guys <laughs> yeah it's against federal law i mean right so all the states that have passed this and so we need to also start pushing i mean are, are we having conversations with our congressional delegation i am of making sure they change that because this whole thing is illegal yeah and that's part of my bill part problem. of my bill is protecting people that work for the state and local health departments many of them may want to pursue it a, a career in law enforcement they could never do that because they are now part of this whole process yeah. so i put that in the bill so i mean when we talk about this this is very comprehensive this is well, huge rocky anderson's issue. lawsuit is that distributing and storing medical cannabis in state health facilities 
will will mess up their ability to maintain their federal charter. Of course. And, and the you, federal, so you and both federal agree money. that that lawsuit's – you agree, David, that that lawsuit was the right – Well, you know, I, I, I tell you this, is that this is what I believe. I believe that anybody that has a disagreement and wants to use any avenue to air their differences, that is part of our American f- uh, fabric. And the legal system for an argument is the right place to take it. It is not screaming and yelling in the streets like we've uh, 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 seen with uh, the inland port. Let's just have a lawsuit. Let's be civil. Uh, uh, battle it out in the in that arena, and then we go forward. Yeah. So I mean, Representative Congressman, you know, he's a representative uh, at the congressional level, McAdams. He's part of that bill that he has co-signed to fix this medical cannabis issue, at least to make sure that this gets out of that list so we are not as a whole state and everybody else in violation of federal law, which oh, could cause other problems. That. So, I mean, things are moving forward. I can tell you um, there's a history um, of even institutionalization of racism behind this whole war on drugs, and we can get into that during the Ronald Reagan administration. I mean, there this is very complicated and disproportionately impacts in terms of prosecution and people incarcerated, communities of color, low income. You know, the 13th yeah, Amendment allows it. So, that. I mean, I have, this is stuff that I've studied and I feel very passionate about, but it's, we need to recognize, um, you know, in the case of our position that we are here for to discuss as a city mayor, I think, you know, there's not much we can do in terms of the legislation itself, but we should be speaking up. Like, you know, we you were saying, we have to make sure that we speak up for what is right and represent the voices of everyone that felt that it was taking, they, they took that away during that repeal and replace that I disagree and was horrible. Let- and we need to make sure that we keep on moving forward with good public policy. Let me add, just add this. You know, it, it, we are so di- disconnected when it comes to federal, state, and city. But the one thing that we can't, you know, we've we got to keep using our voice that, that uh, the federal law uh, supersedes all others. And when it comes to immigration and it comes to, uh, 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 you know, uh, medical marijuana and other things, this, these, the federal Federal government has to take the role and fix some of these. Our prisons are overloaded for all the wrong reasons. And we've got a problem that we can't fix just as a state. And if we go, and the federal government has got to start doing their role better, and we've got a mess in uh, 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 Congress. For heaven's sakes, do you know what the uh, trust level is of the United States Congress? Eight percent. 8%. 8%. In 1963, it was 86%. And now it's 8%. We've, 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 well, we've it's, got to reconnect. And, and I tell you that I believe it, it, it and that's one, one of the reasons I want to be the next mayor, is let's start fixing some things that we can fix so our residents feel that government is listening and not just pointing out more problems. we yeah. got to fix some things. Yeah, and I, I want to switch gears now. We have only about 12 minutes left before. Oh, you know. shucks. We were just getting warm about <laughs> Yeah, this could go on a long time. But I, the one of the biggest issues, mm-hmm. I think, is that's facing our country and our states and our cities is homelessness. Mm-hmm. And we... Uh, I, I kind of look at this as an underlying economic problem, which is... You have supply and you have demand. And anytime you subsidize something, you place a subsidy on it, you're going to get more of it. Anytime you you sort of tax something, you get less of it. That's just the basic law of economics. And our inclination is, of course, to always be compassionate to homeless people. But the cities that we see that are the most compassionate, Seattle, Portland, you know, uh, uh, San Francisco, they have the biggest homeless problems, and they are really getting uh, in worse and worse shape. Right. And and the governments, um, the 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 police officers say they have their hands tied. They want to be compassionate, and everybody wants compassion. Mm-hmm. But we're seeing more and more homeless people right. as compassion increases. Right. Do you see those two things being linked right. together, David? Well, let me tell you this: is that absolutely uh, when we when we take a look at our uh, homeless situation, and I recently took a trip to Los Angeles and uh, uh, visited uh, their um, uh, twenty six thousand five miles. The National Automobile Dealers Association just 
has always had their convention in San Francisco every third year, just pulled out for the very reason of homeless. Seattle, mm-hmm. Seattle, uh, there's an article, I believe it's called Seattle is Dying or the Death uh, of Seattle. Yeah, and as we And, and really as we look at the, uh, in, in those cases, a council that, 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 that came down on that an individual has the right to public sp- space to sleep and live. I don't know how you call that compassionate. I don't just, it just didn't seem to me that I wouldn't treat my brother or sister that way. I'm not going to have somebody have to sleep in the street. We're more compassionate at that, particularly when you look at the percent that are shelter resistant that are suffering from mental illness. And when the, you can't make a decision for yourself and then drug addiction on top of that takes this population to 80%, we have to help them. And the best way to help them is get them into a secured area to sleep. And that's not a resource center. A resource center is for somebody who's chosen that I want help and to go through. And I believe that we're going to see some really nice uh, effect from the resource center. But we have to address the shelter resistant. I've uh, met with some consultants nationally. I've visited some cities, San Antonio, and uh, that have gotten to a uh, functional zero. From 960 on the night I was there or the morning, 5 a.m., five people. Is a resource center different than a homeless center? Yes, way different than a homeless center. A resource center is where somebody's going to check in. Don't they don't have to leave at the end. Uh, 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 the shelter is just where you go to sleep, and then mm-hmm. you have to leave, yeah. and then you got to go stand in line to see if you're going to get back in. So if you're having to leave, and then you're going over to St. Vincent's to get a meal, and then you got to come back and stand in line, how are you ever going to find work? Mm-hmm. Because where's your stuff going to be held? So yeah. you know, a shelter is way different. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of things that were uh, uh, in the shelter, you have to give, uh, uh, you know, whether it was handled right or wrong or what have you, the state and the governor, they did something uh, 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 to at least we've got, you know, we've got what, Luce, uh, 80 80 million, uh, uh, close to a hundred million dollars. And we already got people complaining that it didn't work and it hasn't even opened. My only concern is that currently we're not addressing the shelter resistant. And I don't believe that we can accept, and I think we have to be more compassionate than to give and allow that that it is a right to sleep on the street. We're more compassionate on that, and we have to handle that similar to Austin, uh, San Antonio, and uh, West Tampa. Do you, do you agree with David on that point, that we shouldn't allow people to sleep in the streets? So, uh, some, Well, some of them, because of trauma, would not seek shelter, and the Constitution protects them. And you, we have organizations like ACLU that will – you know, come down and um, and sue cities for that, and I think that's been part of those fights that we were describing in in San Francisco and you know uh, Portland. Portland. And but I was thinking where my husband's from, Washington State, um, Seattle. So let me start. One is we need to recognize the diverse communities within the population that's um, you know experiencing homelessness. That's a very broad and diverse population. So you have the, you know, like families or, you know, single parents with children. Those are people that are, like many people are, one paycheck away, one catastrophic illness away, a divorce away, losing a job away from homelessness. I mean, the insecurity is there, and that could happen to many people. It could happen to people right now that we're here. So those are the ones that are, will be like in a resource center where they just need that transitioning um, until they get a job, you know, they're back into their feet where maybe, maybe through divorce they lost everything, but they just need to get back at some skill training. It may not happen in 30 days. It may not happen in 90 days. And I think that's one of our biggest problems in our model is that we need to recognize that transitional housing, it's needed. So we go from shelter to affordable housing. You know, it may be even transitional housing. Victims and survivors of domestic violence, I worked for, as a dom- domestic violence state coordinator for years. They take up to two years to get them stable with all the things they need. They need child care. I mean, all of these other pieces. So those are things that we can do through resource centers. I'm concerned that we have less beds than we had in the in the in a road home. But let's go now into the, the ones, the 10% that are chronic homelessness. Those are people that have been homeless for more than sometimes five years. 
they they they're resistant to um, shelter due to trauma many instances they've been human trafficking victims or survivors and they have charges so then we go into our criminal justice system and that also limits the ability to use some federal funding for example to serve them so we have to be creative I call it wraparound services. We have to build relationships with them. They have to trust. If they have trauma, they have to trust. And I'm not a social worker by um, by trade and by you know by education, but I've been enough on the business as a domestic violence you know wor- that I work in that field to understand that you have to build trust. So I like um, models. There's evidence-based models, data-driven information on how to do this, where you take and you bring those services to them. You have places where they can take showers, where they can, and some in buses, right? I, I live in Rose Park, so you have the Jordan River. That's where they've been since they moved out of Rio Grande. They've spread now all over the city. Yeah, so and, and so going back to that, I th- this is kind of the timeline I see of events. Housing first, you know, Lloyd Pendleton mm-hmm. partnered with the city. We wanted to put all the, the homeless state. in and mm-hmm. in, in homes. And uh, DCD, the Department of Economic Economy. Yeah, and then yeah. he did his tour around the country, mm-hmm. celebrating that we 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 beat ten years homelessness. Like in we ten just, years, yeah, yeah, we we totally won the war on homelessness. And then, and and no politician has said any sort of causation between the two. But then, a friend of mine who works at the Crossroads Urban Center said he saw busloads of homeless people showing up, and they were getting off the bus. They were saying, from I'm other homeless. States. Yeah, yeah, from other states. I'm homeless. I want a house. I want to be here. This is even better than Portland, even better than Seattle. Vegas. Yeah. And it was just, yeah, a lot a lot of from yeah. Vegas. And he, and he said that happened, but nobody wants to say that one caused the other. Do you think that any, there no. is anything to do with our Operation Rio well, Grande having to happen because we had the Housing First Initiative? Well, I'll let you answer that. Um, no, I think... Now, I'll tell you, I do know for a fact that they even fly them from other parts of the country because Utah is very compassionate and and we have more services sometimes than other places. But I don't think that that's all it. When you actually talk to people and I've been talking to people, I've done the rounds in the Jordan River Parkway. Some people are from they're from Utah, not from Salt Lake City. I mean, so you do have a, a there was a group of population that came, but they're not necessarily your homeless, um, your trauma. Uh, resistant to shelter those are seeking services Uh, the ones that we're talking about the ones that people you know that their incidents where there's a very mental health substance abuse very clear are people that didn't have access to any services and they will require some case management at a very different level and those are not being bus i mean those are people that may not even get on a bus that you know they're just and it seems like the opioid epidemic also led to the need for operation rio grande but now looking at the aftermath of Operation Rio Grande, where do we go from here, David? Well, I tell you, I uh, end my day by walking this city for about 45 minutes to unwind. And over the last 19 years, this city has changed. In the last two, drastic. On my street where I live, on uh, one, uh, at the Club Condo on 150 South and 300 uh, East, that is now one of the most dangerous streets in our city. And, uh, uh, you know, I disagree on uh, the idea of bringing services to folks that are on the street. We need to get folks off the street. And, uh, and we need to have neighborhoods, neighborhoods again. We need to have folks that can visit our city and enjoy Salt Lake City the way that it was intended. And we have to be more compassionate by having a place for folks to go. Now, the cities that have solved that have uh, fit within the constitutional rights of the individuals, and they can move someone if you have a place to move them to. You can't tell somebody to leave if they don't have anywhere to go, but in our city, we we have to have, uh, 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 you know, pandering and and, and uh, uh, panhandling, rather, and uh, things of that, that nature, we've got to stop. We've got to put uh, our walking per- patrol officers that walk a beat like the 50s and know the, the uh, merchants, know the folks that work there, and know the people in need personally, and in a kind way start to move people where they can get help. Now, other cities have done that, and we want to— you know, be blind to it is is just crazy. 
you know, we can, we can get a, a, out of our office, go get on a plane, go visit it and experience it and not just talk about it. And the data is there. We have to be data driven and have access to what every single person's displaced. Where did you come from? I ask. Yeah, that's that Where is Where do a you good come question. from? Very About forty percent of the people that I ask are not from Salt Lake City. Yeah, and they're and 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 many are from Utah. Well, I, but did a, this, I did a documentary on yeah. the on the issue. I interviewed twelve homeless yeah. people. I asked them where they come from, why they're homeless. The two young people who looked probably the best. I asked them why are you homeless, and they told me they're homeless by choice, mm -hmm. and because they didn't want to work at Walmart, they didn't want to work at McDonald's. They would rather camp by the Jordan River and be next to nature, and I was like, "If that's an option, and how available, did they get their money? Why? Yeah, I, I guess they got you, their free meals." You, and you know, you I, I you know. had a we had a reporter, James Brown. I don't know if you you know James, but he he went undercover, and he I think he was getting like two hundred and fifty dollars a day panhandling, and 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 it's an industry, but the one thing that we've got to do is a look at the problem, identify the cause and put actions into motion and not more studies. Yeah, and Luz, I know you gotta go. Um, do you have any closing um, statements on your overall vision for Salt Lake City to, to improve? Well, thank we you again, going? Utah Stories, for doing this and the opportunity to highlight this is a crowded race and we're it's an exciting race and you know been um, just dedicated in the last four months since we jump into this race, uh, full time into this, had to leave my job to do this and you know um it's been great we what we're asking people in this moment is for them to look at the people's experience record and reputation and and just think about what it will look like to have a mayor that represents the diversity of our state as well a woman it's important i think that representation matters and and having someone that can work in collaboration with the state and has that record doing that is is really critical on very important issues like the ones we just discussed and those i'm um, I don't know that everyone has a solution for everything or has the answers. I don't, but I know how to listen, and I want to be a convener. That's what I've done. I'm, I bridge, you know, as as a build bridger, you know, we build bridges to bring people together and collaborate. That's how I want to take the approach as a Salt Lake City Mayor, and I'm excited to get people's support. Thank you. Great, thank you. And David, what's your what's would you how would you describe in a nutshell your overall vision for Salt Lake? Well, I think that I bring a different set of skills in that uh, I'm a problem solver. I've been an executive CEO for 30, 40 years. It's a different set. I've never run for a political office. This is not a stepping stone for me. It's a destination. I will never run for another office in my life. This is not what was my dream job. But fixing our city and getting my hands on the steering wheel is what I want to do. And I'm a different choice. I'm not a politician. And I do have a track record of problem solving. And I would encourage everyone to look into my background from my foundation of putting 89 kids through college, from uh, coaching uh, over 1,000, and being a coach, performance coach for hundreds of companies and CEOs all across this country. It's a different skill set, and that's what I'm offering uh, Salt Lake City, and I hope to serve because nobody will work harder than me. Yeah. Well, I got to say, it's going to be a difficult choice. Again, you two are two of my top favorite candidates, and I really like what you both have to say. And it's going to be a tough decision. And I think people will, I hope, hopefully, you know, really research the issues and understand what they're voting for. And, okay. and hopefully we'll get a, a better, uh, you know, connection between state policy and city policy. And we it can only can, get better. Yeah, it can only really get better. <laughs> can it? It's pretty bad right now. <laughs> so anyway, thanks again, guys, Thank for coming. On. I really you. appreciate it. Thank you. And I have a gift over here for both of you. Oh, we, we put on the Made in Utah Festival. Oh, fun. And we have a Made in Utah gift Perfect. box for you. Oh, Thank you. And you have a little bundle, like a bee. It's yeah. like my logo. Thanks for watching the Utah Story Show. I really appreciate it. So, I got to tell you about a massive, huge, upcoming event we have coming. Made in Utah Festival. It's our fourth year doing it. Uh, this festival is incredible because it's a giant party 
where you can actually drink beer, enjoy amazing food, buy from local vendors, and also enjoy local music on two sound stages. We describe it as a farmer's market on steroids. It's incredible. My wife puts it on. She's been working with her team for months on this festival. You just have to see it to believe it. It's amazing. Um, at the Gateway, August 24th and 25th, I would check out madeinutahfest.com for more information on that. Um, also, I want to tell you, uh, we have a few members, actually. Our Utah Stories membership is a new thing we're offering. We don't want to fill this podcast full of ads. Instead, we really want to bring to you um, local important issues that really matter, that affect the quality of life in Utah. We believe strongly that journalism, local journalism, serves a key component to maintaining our sovereignty, making people aware of the buying choices that they make. And if, and if we can help you buy local by picking up this book, we all become stronger if we don't fill our communities full of chain stores. Um, I, I have a lot more to say about that that I'll skip right now. But if you become a Made in Utah, Utah Stories member, it's $99 a year or $9.99 per month. We will send you to our VIP section of our Made in Utah Festival where you can sample some of the best entrees made by local chefs. We've, we're partnering with these amazing local chefs. They're going to come and put on a demonstration of how they make these, these entrees, and then you get to try them. And then also you get to enjoy craft cocktails made by local distilleries and local bartenders, made in Utah, craft cocktails, beer at the VIP section. We're going to send you there. It's a uh, $45 value. It comes included with your Made in Utah membership. And, uh, and again, that's $99 a year or $9.99 per month. Visit utahstories.com to order that and click on the member uh, button there. Um, so I wanted to also mention we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary of printing this magazine. It's quite amazing. I, uh, reluctantly went into print as a programmer. I was very much a digital dude and, but I produced, uh, the content with other writers and really got interested in providing in-depth local journalism. We thought when we launched this magazine 10 years ago that if we did three issues, that would be amazing. I would put all three in frames and just put them up somewhere special and say this was my attempt to be in print. Ten years later, I can't believe it's been that long. It's it, We've actually survived. And despite what everybody says about print being dead and dying, uh, amazingly, it actually works. When you put an ad in a magazine, when you put an ad in this magazine, people come to your business and people call because we tell everybody the only way we produce this magazine and the only way it works is by you, the readers, picking one up and visiting all the amazing advertisers you find inside. That's um, called advertising and it actually works in other places besides Facebook and Google. You can go figure. So anyway, um, big thanks to you for making it possible. It would never be possible without you. And I don't know if it's you in particular, but our readers who pick up the book every month and visit our advertisers. So um, i got to read an, our uh, ad now. So this episode of Utah Stories is brought to you by Curry Pizza. Curry Pizza is absolutely incredible. You've heard of diners, drive-ins, and dives. Just after, they've only been open for like two years. Guy Fieri uh, had to come, or Fieri uh, had to come and visit them and check out their pizza because it's like the best of Indian food put on a pizza with a non crust. It's absolutely amazing. You got to come and try it. I would just fly to Utah if you're from some other state just to try curry pizza. It's incredible. Um, <clears throat> All right, so you can uh, follow Utah Stories on Instagram. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, or probably the best way to follow and keep track of what we're doing is to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, our Utah Stories newsletter. We also put out a Made in Utah newsletter and Utah Bites by Ted Scheffler. Subscribe to our newsletters by visiting utahstories.com or find the membership information there and become a member. 
Production assistance for the Utah Story Show is provided by Connie Lewis and Louie Lewis. The Utah Story Show is produced by Utah Stories, copyright 2019, all rights reserved. Thank you.